some of the most successful environmental agreements that we've done as a civilization have really been about protecting and saving these parts of the world that still belong to all of us and that can still be managed through science. And Antarctica is one of them. Welcome to Sea Has Many Voices. This is the brainchild of this man, Dr. Gregory Stone, right here, and Christine, his amazing cohort. And this is the time now, and I'm so grateful to be uh, able to co-executive produce this with you and co-host this with you, but this is the time now for us to be having these conversations and building community and action around ocean. Wow. Thank you for that. that you grounded us. <laughs> <laughs> you grounded us. Thanks, Ian. I love that. Um, yeah, everybody, welcome to this week's show. And uh, really amazed and lucky to have one of my favorite people that I admire in the world, Dr. Marga Gual Soler. I love saying her name. Uh, hi. And, hi, Marga. And I, I have to. I want to acknowledge uh, uh, Christine Zinneman, uh, our, Ian mentioned, because you came to us through Christine. Uh, you reached out to her for her work in climate adaptation in uh, small island developing states. And uh, I remember the, when you reached out, then I kind of rode Christine's coattails into the <laughs> thing, and, I, and then you started asking me to give speeches and stuff. We, <laughs> we all ride Christine's coattails. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's and, right. And, and, uh, you know, I, and I remember I, I said to you, so what is science diplomacy? And you said, because you, you used to ran, run, you ran the... Mm -hmm. uh, Science Diplomacy Division at AAAS. I mean, that's a big deal. AAAS is yeah. like top trumps. That's the top drawer in science. And uh, Will you explain just for, for everyone what that is? Yeah. Well, that's what, I'm, that's what I was saying. I didn't know what it was. And she <laughs> said to me, Greg, it's what you and Christine do. <laughs> so, and now, Marga, uh, one of the reasons I admire you is you've got fantastic energy. You've got a vision for the world. You, and you are a, a successful woman in science, which is a tough thing. And you look at what's going on right now. Like the, I've been watching the news with this uh, the U.S. soccer team, right? The female mm -hmm. soccer team. It's bringing the, this issue up to the top, and you know we're hearing a lot more about this. And and uh, he, you are a model. You know, it, it probably was five times harder for you to get to where you are than for me to get to where I got to, because of the gender the gender difference and things that we need a lot of correction on. So, I, I mean, what are, do you know? What, What's the story with women in science? Is it getting better? Was it hard? I mean, how did you how did you get to where you are to be a big influencer? Thank you, thank you, Greg, and and thank you, Ian, first for for doing this. I think um, this exercise of bringing voices from the ocean and from the environment to the table is exactly what you're asking me about. How do we bring more women in science, and how do we elevate them? Yes. So the inclusion of all voices and all stakeholders that have some to, something, something to say about the environment and are affected by how the environment is collapsing. And, and so how do we bring everybody that's affected by the change and how do we bring and give agency to those that can um, influence the decisions that will shape our planet? So one of these groups that has been underrepresented in environmental and ocean and climate decisions are women and as you know as you were an early explorer in Antarctica <laughs> um, some of the most successful environmental agreements that we've done as a civilization have really been about protecting and saving these parts of the world that still belong to all of us and that can still be managed through science and Antarctica is one of them so I am a scientist. I am not a research scientist anymore. I worked at the American Association for the Advancement of Science, as you mentioned, for the last five years, building a capacity building program for science diplomacy training around the world and using science to, to be this language of understanding between countries, even if they are at odds politically or diplomatically. And mm. we can talk about some of those countries mm. If, mm. You, if you like. But I think you're, when you arrived into our world, so we were doing this science diplomacy awareness um, exercise for a few years. And a lot of the people who were practitioners and doing this did not call it that label. It was a label that we and a number of scientific societies, mostly in the US and, and in the UK, uh, and some governments, they decided to put a, a, a label, an umbrella term, to define how science impacts policymaking and diplomacy. So science diplomacy is a practice that you've done 
for a long time mm. that Christine and, 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 and her people have done for a long time, science following, uh, uh, organizing um, nations using science, um, especially with ocean navigation and, and all of that, right? Yeah. And, and, and finding the natural resources that can sustain us and share them with our neighbors. So it's a very... I would say old practice that didn't get a name until now. And so when we were looking for speakers um, for this science diplomacy conference, uh, Christine uh, was, um, I think she was suggested by us because also there was, uh, it was an invitation to her and to President Tong. Yep. And, and we didn't know that you would come with a package. <laughs> that was a stowaway. That's a, that's a great package. Christine, <laughs> President Tong, and Dr. Greg Stone. Exactly. And when they arrived, I, I was like, I can't let these stowaway. people leave. I need to get a lot out of them. So the, the, the first offer was like, okay, Greg, we're doing this uh, online video for Science Diplomacy to explain what it is. Would oh, you be uh, interesting, interested in participating? And then you ask me, but what is science diplomacy? <laughs> it's just what you do. Just go and explain what you do. And that's how we built, I would say, the, my favorite segment of that video is you explaining how in Antarctica you realize the power of science for diplomacy and yeah. peace. Yeah. No, it's right. Uh, I, I just love the way you guys packaged it because I, I, although I was a practitioner, I didn't really know that I was. Right. But science it has turned out to be the thi one thing that we as nations can do with each other, it's non-political, mm -hmm. it's non, uh, it, it, the, the science conversations, if you notice, go on, even at the height of the Cold War with the Russians, we were shaking hands with them in space. Right. We were working with them on science projects. Uh, it, so it, it's a tool that it seems to be, have some immunity for some reason to all the other stuff that gets in the way of us getting along on this planet and you know fixing the problems and you know i, I just want to say before we started to roll the tape you know we were talking uh, ian was talking about your your how many your, your daughter and uh and the responsibility you felt well, how did you say it you said something about when she came out into this world you well the, what, the way that the conversation started was we were just giving margo a ton of praise but you looked at me and you said, you know, Ian, and, and it's very rare to hear him say this, but he said, you know, I'm worried. And I said, and you should be. Because the collapse of oceanic uh, ecosystems right now, uh, be it from acidification, temperature rise, plastics, overfishing, what have you. When I, when I look around at other parents, right, on the the playground or I'm sitting there with my daughter. Our daughter's 23 months old. But when that child came out, is, was, it was when the first time it ever, you know, I was saying that we, Greg and I have done so much ocean conservation together just in the decade that we've known each other, but what he's been doing for 35 years. But it didn't literally punch me in the face that there was not just a need, but there was an immediate need for drastic change not just amongst nations, but amongst people, households, consumers, that the fact that every parent can't look at each other across party lines or borders and say, this is the most important story of our time because we're leaving these children, our children that we care so much for. You know, we worry if they fall off of the couch. We worry about every step they take and yet we don't worry all day, every day, and try and fix what's going on outside of our own front doors. And that is what I feel is now becoming, it, that tide is changing. Mm -hmm. That conversation is actually changing. You know, you're right. I, you, you're right. I have not said very often how worried I am, have I? Never. It's, that, it's, uh, you, don't, you don't hear, that's what hit, I'm saying. You don't hear that it's much hit from me, him. It's hit me over the last six months. Right. I've been doing some uh, for some calculations of my own on... Uh, the, the, the onset of this climate change. And, you know, I've always had an opti optimistic view of conservation and, you know, been involved in creation of the first MPAs and all that. And I always figured we'd work it all out, you know. Mm. But this climate insult, it, it's, it's coming so fast. You know, it, it, the, in short, when you go home at night and you turn on a light and it's being generated somewhere by a fossil fuel, you are using Jurassic sunlight. 
Mm. We're releasing Jurassic sunlight. It was stored 270 million years ago in the Jurassic when the whole world was like Bahama-like. That's, that was the climate of the Jurassic, Bahama-like. Right. And we are rapidly sending ourselves back to that ice-free world with the energy that we stored from the Jurassic. We're, we're, we're sending ourselves to, in a runaway climate scenario some four to 5,000 times faster than the original Jurassic mm-hmm. arrived, okay? And that's the problem, is the speed at which this is happening. You know, the, 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 the modelers are always under, they, it's always worse than the model. The models predict one thing and now it's always worse. Mm-hmm. Sea levels are faster, the oceans are hotter, there's more ice melting, and the key for our planet is we need ice. Uh, nice. All humanity, all primate evolution happened in an icy world, right? It's, it's, it makes the ocean go. It starts the whole uh, uh, current system. It, it's just there's so many connections to ice, and we've got runaway ice melting at both poles right now, and I'm just, I don't know how we're going to stop it. I mean, and we got 10 years, uh, scientists that uh, have been working on this through the U.N., to really get our act together, and we're just not paying attention. It, it's like if you, you know, you, a lot of people look back to World War II as the, the last time the world really pulled together and did the right thing. And it, if you use that analogy, it's like we're sitting here letting Nazi Germany just keep mm-hmm. taking countries, and we're not doing anything about it. Right. We just thinking, ah, oh, well, we'll work on it. We'll figure it out. I don't know. You know, it's it's, it's that serious, everybody. We really have to just put the alarm on and uh, stop this crazy uh, use of fossil fuels for, for burning them. Yeah, they actually have other uses that we can't do without. The petrochemical industry, there are certain things you use with oil, and we've already gone at the peak of oil, right? There's a peak. We've used most of the oil. <laughs> so we should, be, we should be thinking about we need to save it, the oil for other things, not to use it for this heating and stuff so i'm worried but i but i'm also fundamentally an optimist and i do think that uh (laughs) there is a solution path through here and and marga is one of the few people that i know in the world that actually understands it and and it's it's we're gonna make it we need science to bring us together more than ever right now and thank you for bridging the gap thank you thank you thank you thank you